you start um, cutting out carbohydrates from your diet, indeed what happened to this study where it goes from an average, you know, the average person is eating about 50 to 60% of their calories from carbohydrate. When you go to a low carbohydrate diet, you're cutting that down to a fifth or a sixth or, you know, a tenth of the amount of calories. So in this study in particular, they went from about 50% of their calories from carbs down to 8%, so, which is pretty typical um, when you adhere to a low-carb diet. Of course, if you start putting less glucose into the system, uh, the body starts making more. There are these natural counter-regulatory mechanisms, which is why glucose levels stay normal. If you take someone who has normal glucose and they adopt a low-carb diet, their glucose will stay normal. It'll continue to hover around 80 milligrams per deciliter. It stays normal because the liver begins making more glucose to make up for the lack of glucose coming in. Now this is relevant to cortisol because there are a small little cluster of hormones that will stimulate the liver to turn on this release of glucose. Growth hormone will do some of this, uh, cortisol will, and epinephrine will, and glucagon. Those are really the main four that are going to be stimulating the liver to make more glucose. And of course, there's a reason for that when that happens. So there is a lot of um, suspicion that if you adopt a low-carb diet, one of the ways you're keeping your glucose normal is because the cortisol is coming in and it's pushing the, the liver to continue to make glucose. Now, the glucose uh, maintenance effect of cortisol is only one. In fact, it's maybe the most benign. Cortisol is a hormone that can, it'll basically destroy everything in order to increase glucose, including stripping proteins from things like your muscles and your bones to get those amino acids, to send those amino acids to the liver, and then tell the liver to convert those amino acids into more glucose. Um, in addition to reducing the immune system as well uh, and changing the way the body stores fat, suffice it to say, cortisol is a hormone we do not want elevated for very long. So it's reasonable to be concerned. Is a low-carb diet going to spike my cortisol? These are the two studies I've seen that look at cortisol in average people, not in the context of, say, an exercise type study. So, some basics on this study. Um, it's body yeah. composition and hormonal responses to a carbohydrate-restricted diet. This is some of the work from the legendary low-carb scientist Jeff Volick while he was at Connecticut. So, in this study, the first point, which I think is interesting, they, they have a control group and then the diet group put on a low-carb ketogenic diet. The group that was put on the low-carb ketogenic diet, they volunteered for the diet. They volunteered for that, which does introduce perhaps a problem from the scientific side. But again, the pragmatist in me says, well, that's more, it's more real life. Right. And they're going to adhere to the diet better because they wanted to do it. Yeah. Now, they were all considered healthy going in. Um, and, and same body weight. The low-carb diet, they transitioned. I mentioned the carbohydrate transition. They went from around 50% down to 8%. And then on um, table one, where they described the macronutrient breakdown, they um, were eating, they went up to eating about 170 grams of protein and about 160 grams of fat. And there we go to that magic one-to-one -one, um, by mass ratio, by mass, the fat and the protein is about one-to-one, -one, which by percent of calorie ends up being 60% fat-ish, 30% protein. And that's, that's, that's a great range. And interestingly, um, sort of conventional keto thinking um, worries about protein because of the insulin spike. Interestingly, in this diet group, they were eating twice as much protein as the control group. Mm. Twice as much protein, and yet their insulin, if we go to table three, the insulin in the diet group, the low-carb group, it changed from around 23 picomoles, which is high, down to 15. So a wow. significant reduction, whereas in the control group, which is eating half the amount of protein, it stayed in the low 20s. It didn't change at all. In fact, it actually tended to go up a bit, but it was within the margin of error, so it wasn't a significant change. One takeaway unintended from this study don't fear protein, because even if you're eating twice as much, and they were literally eating twice as much as the control group, their insulin still dropped significantly. So awesome. don't, yeah, don't immediately just think protein's gonna be a problem. All right, now another takeaway, before I get to the gist of it all, which was the hormone changes, they looked at differences in body mass. 
cortisol will reduce lean mass. It will literally strip the proteins from muscles and bones, like I said earlier, to get those amino acids to feed the liver in stimulating new glucose production. So you'd think, well, if cortisol is going to be up, then they ought to be losing muscle mass. And, and on figure one, if any of you guys are able to follow this, they found that the body mass didn't change significantly in the control group, which is good. They didn't want them to change. In the, despite eating roughly the same amount of calories, though, the, the body mass did significantly change. It went down by a little over two kilograms in the diet group, in the intervention, the low-carb group. Interestingly, and, and evidence that we can never just look at body mass total, the sum of it, and know, what we're, know what's happening. We can't just look at the scale. They found that fat mass actually reduced by over three kilograms in these six weeks, and lean body mass, so muscle and bone mass um, mostly, actually went up by over a kilogram, and it was a statistically significant difference. So this idea that I'm going to adopt a low-carb diet and, and the lack of insulin or the, you know, whatever, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make me lose lean mass. I'm not going to be able to either retain my lean mass, let alone build it. Well, they built it. They, they added a kilogram, so a little over two pounds, um, just in these six weeks without reporting any significant changes in the exercise. Ben, we can show you hundreds of clients that, at Instant IQ and Elevate that we've done. Rarely do we see a decrease in muscle mass over months and months and months. And this is even in the absence of them getting into the gym and doing oh, yeah, squats yeah. and deadlifts. And, they're losing, and they're, lo they're losing 30, 40, 50 pounds of fat. Yeah, and yeah. you think just because of decreased mass, yep. they would lose protein, and they're not. Or muscle yep. mass, they're not doing it. Yep. It's just staying steady. It's yeah, and they used a DEXA in yeah. this study, which is a much, yeah, that's one of the gold standards, right. really. But we're just not seeing it. And they also looked at, lastly on figure um, one, they looked at bone mineral content. And no change. There was no loss of bone mass, which is meaningful because if there's someone listening to this who is beyond middle age, especially a woman, and you're thinking, well, I want to go on a low-carb diet because I, I want to lose weight, the fear with conventional dietary intervention with you know, low fat, low calorie, sure you're losing weight, but you are losing bone mass. As in, in fact, a significant amount of lean body mass. This study suggests that that doesn't have to happen. You can lose fat exclusively while retaining bone mass and even increasing your muscle mass within this six-week study. So don't assume you, you have to have that negative that there's going to be an unintended con consequence of losing lean body mass, muscle and bone, as you lose the fat mass. It doesn't have to happen that way. Uh, insulin wants to tell things to grow, but bones can become insulin resistant. Joints can become insulin resistant. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, the joints is that we have to have the joints making this fluid to kind of keep the joint greased. Right. And those cells that make this fluid are, are very uh, poorly vascularized. They don't get a lot of blood. And so they, they don't get to see a lot of oxygen. And so they are, they are relying more heavily on a process called non-oxidative glycolysis. They need to use glucose and a lot of it. And if they become insulin resistant, their access to glucose becomes compromised, thereby compromising the joint because wow. they don't have enough energy. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. Now, last, last bit here, and then I'll be done. Um, they, the, the hormone pattern, and that's table three. So they found that I already mentioned the significant drop in insulin um, in the low-carb group despite eating twice as much protein, and they were eating three times more fat. Um, glucagon actually tended to go up a little bit. It did, it did not reach statistical significance. The error was too much, um, but it tended to go up. Testosterone didn't change. Um, and then I, I don't want to get to cortisol yet. So IGF-1, uh, remember, these guys were eating two times more protein, right? And the, the typical thinking is, so IGF-1 is relevant because people who don't like protein or who are afraid of dietary protein, they say, the protein's going to cause cancer, and that's going to be because you give it an increase in IGF-1. Because IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, is a factor that is implicated in, in help of facilitating cancer growth. They were eating twice as much protein, and their IGF-1 didn't change. It literally didn't change. Hmm. Not, not, not even one single value point throughout the length of the study. And then let's get to the cortisol, finally. One thing that was so interesting here, well, first of all, cortisol did not significantly change and tended to go down by a lot, actually. But the, the standard error was massive in this study, which I think um, creates a bit of a problem. But the sum of it 
was no significant difference. It did not go up and, in fact, tended to go down, but it was not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So directly challenging the idea that a low-carb ketogenic diet is going to stimulate your cortisol. Now, I told you guys I was going to reference one other study. Let me just mention it quickly. This is a study published last year, actually, in 2019 in the journal Nutrition Research. Uh, the PubMed ID, and you guys can look it up with this, it's 3080. 3508. This, in contrast, looked at, more, at obese humans and put them on a low-carb diet. And there were a tremendous number of takeaways, including incredible weight loss, incredible improvements in lipids, great reduction in insulin. Um, they did find a difference in cortisol. And so let me briefly share that. From baseline until week two, the women the female group, not the men, the women, had a statistically significant marginally. It was less than 0.05 but above 0.01, so a marginally but still statistically significant increase. And then by week eight, it was gone. Wow. So at week two, not in the men though, no significant differences in the men. In the, women, in the female group, at week two, there was a slight, and I mean like a tenth of a point in the cortisol. It was slight, but it, so whether it's meaningful or not is debatable. It was statistically significant at week two, but then it was gone at week eight. So maybe, is there some truth to the claim that a low-carb diet will raise your cortisol? Maybe. In this one study, in the women-only group, at week two there was, but as it continued, it was gone. And that might be just reflective of this transition phase. That's You've done change. something very different, yeah. and maybe you do need a little more of those gluconeogenic hormones, like cortisol, for example, to help the liver keep the glucose normal in this transition phase, and then you've adapted over the next few weeks and everything has gone back down to normal.